Chairman Seiler, members of the committee, my name is Greg Newhouse. I'm an attorney in Grand Island, Nebraska. I've been practicing for 35 years. I'm not promoting something. This is promoting an agenda. This bill is promoting an agenda. I'm promoting a child, the best interest of a child. Actually, sir, what this bill is doing, what this bill is doing is making it so that somebody is not discriminated against on the basis of their sexuality. And you are sitting here opposing that bill. Well, with all due respect, Senator, it does more than that. It has to do with sexual orientation. It has to do with marital status. It has to do with a whole lot of things. All you've concentrated on all day is sexual orientation. That's not the whole thing in this bill. It's also marital status. And I'm just as opposed to placing a child with an unmarried heterosexual couple. And why is that, sir? Because they don't think it's in the best interest of a child. So my mother was a single mother for 15 years. I grew up. I didn't get into trouble. I went to school. I went to school after working full-time for two years. I went to night school while working full-time for two years. I had a part-time job on top of that. And then I went to the University of Nebraska and worked my way through the University of Nebraska. And then after that, I went to the University of Nebraska College of Law. During that time, I started a nonprofit that now employs 30 full and part-time staff. My mother was a single mother. Did she do something wrong? I didn't say she did. No. I'm not saying But that's... under your rationale, sir. May I answer? No, may, you may not. Well, I under, can... under your rationale, well, sir. I'm not going to just be lectured to. If you want to ask me a question, I'll answer. Under your rationale, sir. You can you can walk away if you'd like, but under I'm gonna finish. Under your rationale. My mother, who's a single mother, likely isn't the most fit parent. And the point that I'm trying to make is that fit parents come in all shapes and sizes, all kinds of sexual orientations. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony. Any further questions? Thank you. Currently, the department uses a 1995 memo uh, that says that since the issue of sexual orientation in foster care is not addressed in statute or regulation, children will not be placed in homes of persons who identify themselves as homosexuals or where unmarried, unrelated adults reside together. This bill is to provide clarity in statute that it will no longer be a policy of the state to discriminate based on sexual orientation and marital status. Are, are you aware, Sarah Norquist, that HHS currently does make placements? with men and women who are gay in I, foster placement? I'm aware that it's uh, ex they, they have, that it's been extremely rare, and that uh, it just shows kind of the arbitrary nature of having a policy like this. So they do. They have violated. When I memo. say they, I mean <laughs> right. HHS violates, or has violated, the very memo that, that we seem to be operating under. That's my understanding. From, from the mid-90s. Uh, I'm going to follow along the same lines as Senator Koash, but I'm going to go a little deeper into this memo. Um, I'm going to bet, I'm not a betting man, but I'm going to bet you that this was not done in compliance with the APA. I'll bet you that this didn't have a public hearing. I'll <laughs> bet you that it didn't have public feedback. Right. And I'll bet you it's illegal. Right, it's an internal memo. I mean, it, it, it's not regulation. So they don't even have to rescind it. You could, you could imply that what NFC and other agencies like Cedars might do, they would not be bound by this, nor would the state be bound by this if it's not in compliance with the APA. And I say that to make everyone aware, we saw this all summer long, where agencies, departments, uh, Department of Corrections, uh, health and Human Services. On Tuesday, it's okay. On Wednesday, we've got a policy change that right. directly relates to the, the Administrative Procedures Act that should have had a hearing, it should have had public access, it should have had feedback, it should have had a process. Um, so I think Senator Kohler is absolutely right. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger question than just That's right. uh, is the department doing it because I, do, I am aware that there have been placements in, in, these, in homes that... Um, do indeed provide quality care for, so right. whether you're on the side of the issue or you're not on the side of the issue, it's happening right now, and this thing isn't worth the paper that it's written on. Would you like to comment on that? No, I, I would just completely agree with you on that, and I Thank think you. we need clarity in either law or regulation on it. 
I have one question. Yeah. Has there been any litigation on this memorandum? There is, and uh, there, I believe there will be somebody testifying after me uh, Good. to discuss it. Okay. Fourteenth Amendment to the Bill of Rights promises equal protection for all, and there's not a footnote that says, but not gay or lesbian people. That is one reason why we are in court right now challenging the memo that you have in front of you. Now, Senator Christ, you're absolutely right. There was no rulemaking process, and yet uh, we are in a position where this is actively hurting children in Nebraska every day. Nebraska not only is one of only two states with a clear ban on gay or lesbian people being foster parents, the other is Utah. We also are the state with we're number one or number two, depending on which study you look at, for the most number of children per capita out of placement. We have 3,000 plus children needing foster homes while we're simultaneously denying qualified folks. You'll hear after me, one of my clients in that litigation, Joel and Todd, are part of the lawsuit. They applied, they passed the background test, they passed the home inspection. We're talking about a decorated military veteran and they were rejected solely because they are in a same-sex relationship. Now, we have tried negotiating with the department, but that memo, despite the fact that it's old and despite the fact that it went through no rulemaking process, is still in effect. Joel and Todd still have no license. That memo is still on the, on the website for the Department of Health and Human Services, sending a chilling effect for any gay or lesbian person that goes on the site, thinking, should I apply, should I be a foster parent? When we're in a situation where qualified people are being turned away as foster parents, of course, I'm in court arguing the 14th Amendment protects the rights of those applicants. But the real people being hurt are the children. Given the fact that a child who's not given a foster home instead is still going to have a roof over their head, but it's going to be a group home, it's going to be a juvenile facility, it's going to be some type of institutional setting. Joel and Todd are there willing to take a child and say to them, how was your day at school? Can I make you a peanut butter sandwich? Do you need any help with your homework? And that's where kids thrive. We could moot out the lawsuit easily by passing this law. It could be easily mooted by having this administration repeal the memo outright. Or I could win my lawsuit. Senator Williams. Are we going to hear from Joel and Todd? They were able to make it here today. I don't know that both are going to testify. At least one will testify. They were scooting here after just having gotten married. So, yes, okay, you'll be hearing from either Joel or Todd. I will hold my question. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Next proponent. We started this process about seven years ago. We had homework to do every night. I mean, before we go to class the next time, we had homework to turn in. And we have those books to, to, to prove that we did all this homework for them. But it's, it's a very, it was a very intense, it's very fun. Our instructors were very good. They were for us to become foster parents. Um, our homestay people were for us for becoming foster parents. It's just that HSS wouldn't give us a license for it. They never met us personally. They wouldn't come to our home, but they had people come to our home, but they said no. And after we went through all the classes and everything, we passed the background checks and all this stuff, that was when we were told, no, you can't be foster parents because you're a gay couple. Not at the beginning. And who specifically told you that? The instructor. Well, no, it wasn't the instructor. So we weren't getting our license, so we contacted HHS, and they said because we're a gay couple, we would not get the license. Because of the memo that took place. Senator Williams. Yes. Um, just one question, and I'm not trying to throw a legal twick trick out here. Yeah. If you would advise your clients whether to answer this question or not. Was there any possibility that they gave you any other reason than your sexual orientation for your inability to have no, foster place? Absolutely not. Thank you. Because we have our home state people were for us. Everybody was for us. Thank you. No home inspection, yes. See nothing further. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Parker, A-M-B-E-R, Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R. Sexual orientation um, on the dictionary.reference.com says one's natural preference and sexual partners. In some sexual orientation, we look at bestiality, and it's in the group of sexual orientation. So one of the issues I have with LB 647 saying that sexual orientation is covered in here, there are areas then that we have now 
um, it's, it comes to who is interpreting now what sexual orientation is. That's a big gray area. That's a, a big danger. I'm sure you guys are uh, know of a group called NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. And I'm saying that any time a state senator is looking at proposed legislation, it's greatly important that we look at the roots, we look at the pros, we look at the cons. We are here to protect the children in the state of Nebraska. One of the questions um, that has not been addressed, if someone is going through different uh, changes, hormonal, let's say a man wants to become a woman, they have to get shots, there are, there are different hormonal changes. If the social worker sees changes, and based upon if LB 647 was to pass, and says they would not be fit, we see some suicidal tendencies. No words have not been given in these areas, but we are concerned for the children's safety. LB 647 has now put that social worker to say this person's sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression is more important because they're afraid of having a lawsuit against them. Hi, my name is Lauren Cousy, L-O-R-E-N-K-U-S-Y, and I'm just here as an outsider. I wasn't here to testify, but uh, after hearing what was going on, I'm a, I'm a straight, loving father of five great kids and a grandson, and after listening to their testimony, um, I would trust them with my, any of my children, and any child would have a safe, loving environment with them just listening to their testimony. Uh, if there's any conflict, um, say a Christian family has a child that needs foster care and the foster parents are Muslim, uh, there could be a conflict there. But I think that the parents need to be taught acceptance instead of in restraint, and instead of uh, worrying about how they're going to feel. There's a reason their kids are in foster care. So maybe they need to learn how to accept and know their kids are safe. And uh, yeah, just teach the rednecks. <laughs> I think that would be okay. I mean, any child would be blessed to live with these gentlemen, I believe. But that's all. Hey, my name is Greg Schleppenbach. I am the executive director of the Nebraska Catholic Conference. We analyze this bill from the perspective that the best environment for the development of a child, especially a child who has experienced abandonment, loss, or abuse, is a household headed by a married man and woman who can contribute in gender complementary ways to providing a stable and healthy family environment. We believe this perspective is well grounded in social science and common sense. Our concern with LB 647 is not simply that it opens the door to less than ideal settings for these wounded children. A bigger concern we have with this bill is that by prohibiting discrimination as it proposes, it will prohibit exercising a preference for placing children in the most ideal setting of a married household. There are legitimate policy reasons for giving preference to foster homes with a married man and woman. LB 647 should be rejected as it fails to uphold that legitimate public policy. Thank you. My name is Marvin Binnick. Last name is B-I-N-N-I-C-K. Do you like my first name spelled? No? Okay. I'm here today to speak in support for LB 647, although I would like to express my support of LB 586 and LB 648. I want to start off by asking, why are we even talking about this? I was a foster child. I spent nearly a decade floating in the system. I lived in five group homes. Sorry, really nervous. And eight foster homes during that time span. Due to the lack of foster parents in Lincoln during that time, I had to live in foster homes or group homes in Hastings, Ashland, Crete, Friend, Blue Springs, and Omaha. What I needed most and what I sought for was a family that would care for me and love me. I wanted a family that would treat me like one of their own. I'm lucky because I ended up finding that in the last foster home I was in with Tim and Michaela Hahn when I was 15 years old. And since then, for the last 10 years, they have been my family. I love them and I know they love me just as much, most likely more. When I was in search for the right family for nearly 10 years, I wouldn't have cared if I lived in a foster home where my parents were part of the LGBTQ community. As long as they advocated for me, cared for me, and loved me, 
I would have been happy living in a foster home where the foster parents were lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or queer was never a possibility, though. I instead lived in foster homes with straight married mothers and fathers. I instead lived in foster homes where I was treated differently. I lived in homes where the foster children were separated and couldn't interact with the biological children. I lived in homes where I was viewed as dangerous, harmful to others for simply being a, a foster child. I lived in homes where I was physically abused, where I was mentally abused, where I was called a slew of horrible names mixed with curse words. In those homes, the parents were supposed to care for me and love me, but instead they were traumatizing. Now, I'm not saying all foster parents that have to be straight or bad or abusive. I'm also not saying that all gay or lesbian couples would be good or healthy foster parents. What I'm saying is if you are a genuinely good person and you want to care for a child that needs it, your sexual orientation should be a non-factor. I know one thing, currently in the state of Nebraska, Gay or lesbian couples that want to adopt or be foster parents have to make one of two sacrifices. Hide their sexual orientation and, and by doing that, sacrifice a big part of who they are as a person so they can care for a child or sacrifice the ability to care for a child or adopt or be foster parents so they can be free with who they really are. If someone is willing to make those kind of sacrifices, I would want them as my parent. I urge you today to vote to advance LB 647. Thank you for your time. Any questions for this witness? <clears throat> Senator Fancy Brooks. I just wanted to thank you for your courageous testimony and for coming forward today. It took a lot, and it's very poignant to hear it from people who go through the whole system. And I'm sorry it was such a difficult time, but I'm glad you have somebody wonderful now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Norfield. I have to go to another hearing, but I also wanted to thank you for your courage to come out today. It's really important for us to hear from stories from people affected um, by things like this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing nothing further, thank you for your testimony. My name is Becca Bruni, B-E-C-C-A-B-R-U-N-E, -E, and I am here as the Child Welfare Program Associate from Nebraska Appleseed. According to data from the most recent Kids Count report, there are 1.25 foster children for every foster home in the state. When children in foster care are unnecessarily placed in a congregate care facility, research shows that those children have worse long-term outcomes than their peers. And another study estimates that having to place youth in emergency shelters or group homes, which are relied upon when foster homes are full, instead of allowing them to be placed with same-sex couples, costs Nebraska between $400,000 and $700,000 each year. Children in foster care need loving and stable homes. Research shows that children raised by same-sex couples are similar to those raised by heterosexual couples in terms of psychological well-being and overall development. Things that have been shown to have an impact on child's well-being are factors like parental stress, parenting strategies, <clears throat> and couples' relationship satisfaction, which also have been proven to be unaffected by a parent's sexual orientation. Senator Chris. This is the last time I'm going to bring this up, but you're in a position that I think you understand. Putting a child with a, in, in a quality home, no matter what it is, is very important. There would be, though, the potential for conflict to take a child out of a particular home. I'd be careful how I'm saying this, but to take a child out of a particular home where there would be conflict between parental visits to that foster home that would be arranged for and supervised by the couple. Would that be one of your considerations to make sure that that when you talk about LBGT child, obviously, but we're talking about another situation, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I think you know more on what I'm talking about here. I'm really concerned about how that interface would be between a particular kind of person and a particular kind of home. Can you talk to me about that just a minute? Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're talking about. So. A straight family that has issues, who have a child that needs to be put in foster care, someone who may not be um, understanding of that particular persuasion or, or uh, to be LGBT, LGBT and the conflict that may happen. Because what we're talking about here is a child who wants to be visited by a parent and supervised under the current system by someone who is their foster parent. So let me just be blunt. 
redneck going into a situation that could, could result in a child being put in a bad position. I want to make sure... And it, so you could have that with race or any of the other of exactly, as well. Exactly. So how do you handle that with anything like race or something? Well, Senator, is, the question is to the social worker, because she deals with it every day. How do you handle it, and, and would that be a consideration for you? And is I, it a consideration now, and would it be a consideration? Right, and I should preface that I, I don't work for the state. I've never worked for the state, so I um, have not been involved in placing children. Therefore, we respectfully submit that we are in opposition to LB 647. Yes. Ms. Bowling, welcome yes. to the Judiciary Hi, High. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. We grew up together. We uh, did. Yeah, Sheridan in Sharps. Yes. Uh, I, I'm just wondering how, I'm, I'm interested in the perspective that that you feel it's burdening the system more to have a greater pool from which DHS, DHHS can uh, choose parents and find safe homes for these kids who are actually hurting significantly. Thank you. I think as stated before, there is no exception in here too with conscience. And so you're creating possible litigation, difficult situations that I think people that care in placement makes it difficult. Not only the people from DHHS, but those that are actually making the decisions how to place them. Okay, so do you believe that, that we should have all sorts of exceptions, such as if you happen to not like a certain race, or if you happen to uh, be a Christian and not want a Muslim child, and you happen, should we be creating these exceptions, or do we trust DHHS to determine the best placement for the child according to the predilections of, of the parents and the foster child. My name is Mara Spentley, M-A-R-I-S-B-E-N-T-L-E-Y. These bills are not about helping children. It is the exact opposite of helping children to promote sexual misbehavior, behavior which tears apart the natural family. After all, it always has and always will take an egg and a sperm to bring about new human life. I would like to read to you the words of a person who has suffered as a result of the kinds of environments that LB 647 and 648 would enshrine into law. They are the words of a woman named Katie Faust, one of an increasing number of adults who are speaking out about their negative experiences growing up in homosexual households. And these are her words, and I quote, When two adults who cannot procreate want to raise children together, where do those babies come from? Each child is conceived by a mother and a father to whom that child has a natural right. When a child is place, placed in a same-sex headed household, she will miss out on at least one critical parental relationship and a vital dual gender influence. The nature of the adult's union guarantees this." End quote. I understand that the foster care system needs work and that there are children who need foster parents. But how about, as a state, we enact laws that will encourage and protect the natural family, which every child so desperately needs, instead of these misguided efforts, which will actually hurt families and children? I'd like to conclude with some words also from Katie Faust, who knows whereof she speaks. And we need to listen to these adult children who've grown up in homosexual households before policy decisions are made which will cause harm to the children of Nebraska. And again, I'm quoting Katie Faust. When it comes to procreation and child rearing, same-sex couples and opposite-sex opposite couples are substantially unequal. And I'm here to speak to you as a former state board, being a former state board myself, and a member of the LGBT community. This bill would affect me directly. Kids don't care if you're a one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader who happens to be gay, or if you're born one gender but identify as another. They just don't care. All they want is a roof over their heads with someone who will give them the love and care that they, have that they should have received from their biological parents. 